in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for the Word of God, and thank you for the, the truths of, of what you have established. And Father, may we understand with clarity the truth of the Word of God. May we be converted by its message. And Lord Jesus, may we warm up to that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Bless us, and through John the Revelator, show us what this Word is about and how we live in this day. May we not be afraid. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and it shall be, for all that I Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, I must admit to you, I give you a lot of information, right? Yes. Okay. And so don't, please don't be overwhelmed, or I give you so much. You can hear it again on GodsWordAlivetoday.org um, if you need a whole set of Revelation tapes. I'll be more than happy to make sure you get them this week. Uh, the whole the whole thing on Revelation, but it's the information is a lot. Just take what you can, okay? Take what you can. Uh, a word for yourself. Just take it. Then I saw another mighty angel, verse chapter ten of Revelation, verse one, coming down from heaven. If you underline the whole idea of coming down, coming down means interceding. The, t the first times we have the word uh, coming down was in the book of Genesis, chapter 11, with the Tower of Babel. Babel. Okay? What was God doing? He was coming down because man was trying to build a name for himself. Are we still trying to build a name for ourselves today? It's called the Grammys. <laughs> okay, and I think what 45 million saw uh, yesterday. Did I, Oscars. Did I did I see it? No, I didn't. I did not watch it. Okay, so uh, we're we're trying to build names for ourselves, um, but that name will not endure. Only the name above all names will endure. So if you underline they're coming down, and, and right now at this moment, uh, I'm doing a new series on heaven, so make sure you get it. Right now, the New Jerusalem is coming down toward us. Do you know heaven is coming after us? Isn't that good news? So, uh, uh, coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud now. The angel's wrapped in a cloud. You got the picture of an angel wrapped in a cloud? Now, when you're in the clouds, um, the cloud, the cloud, what, one of the first clouds that you've heard in the Bible, it's when God was leading the Israelites out of Egypt. A cloud by day and a fire by night. The clouds in the Bible is what is called a theophany. When God comes now, He comes in a presence that is so noticeable even around Him. Theo means God, phani means a manifestation. So this angel is a mighty angel, which means very strong. In Mark chapter 6, a part of walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, which I want to teach us, is the idea that you can do mighty deeds. The word for mighty deeds is kratos. But you know what? If I were to talk to you all individually, you would probably have to confess to one another, I haven't done mighty deeds. Wouldn't you like to? Wouldn't you like to know the full release of the Holy Spirit that you have within you, what you can do for the world around you? How many of some of you tolerate too much and you don't have to tolerate it at all? Use the power of the Spirit called Kratos. So he's coming, wrapped in the cloud with a rainbow over his head. When do we, when do we uh, encounter a rainbow? I mean, this is a strange angel. He's a big dude, cloud, and a rainbow over his head. Remember we encountered the rainbow? In Revelation 4 and 5, where was the, where was the first rainbow? Genesis. Remember the Genesis? In Genesis 9, God said he never what? Flood the earth again. Number two. When's the second uh, rainbow? The second aim rainbow is in um, the second rainbow is in Revelation four, when the rainbow is over the throne where God is. Here's what the rainbow means. The rainbow means where God is, there's peace. How many know where God is not? There's chaos, right? Have you discovered that in your house yet? <clears throat> when there's yelling and screaming going on, nobody here has yelling and screaming in their home, right? When there's yelling and screaming going on, God's not there. God's only where there's peace and harmony. So now we have the rainbow. 
And I, I think I showed you that the rainbow <coughs> is really very interesting because it's a real bow and arrow. Humanity was flooded, but now the arrow goes up to heaven and the arrow hits somebody. Who did the arrow hit? The Lord Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So that's why we see Jesus with his... In yesterday's um, um, first reading from Isaiah 49, can a mother ever forget her baby? The image we've always had was a hand, and there's the little child. But the child is laying in the very, what, the palm. And the palm for, for us with Christ is where Jesus was wounded for us. Well, what, what a great Savior. And his face was like the sun. See the face like the sun again? So again, this angel is very what? Extremely bright, isn't it? Does anybody remember a, a great saint in the Bible that had a face like a sun? Moses. Moses, very good. Uh, so did, Exodus 33. So what? did Satan, didn't he? Didn't no, Satan didn't have a, a, a bright. He was originally Lucifer, and then uh, he, he, he took, a, he took a, a joyless ride down to earth. Yeah. Saint Stephen. Mm. He, had the, he had the face like a, mm. like a sun. Mm. So he was in the very presence that God allowed him, and Jesus stood up when he was coming in. So this angel is really... Now look at the next part. And his legs like pillars of fire. Hello? Clouds and fire. Hello, what do you see here? Jesus. Yes, but what do you see here? Exodus. There's the Exodus. There's the Exodus. And so all, already we know something about this angel. What's he going to do? He's going to lead us out. And he's going to give us a final warning, right? One thing that one, one thing that's very, very clear, which when we get to Revelation 18, yet away from sinful people. Don't fellowship with sinful people. Well, they come over every Thanksgiving. Give them the bird and tell them to hit the road after that, you know? Don't hang out with people who will pull your faith down. Amen? Don't be with people who attack your faith constantly. Because we got to be led by a cloud <coughs> and fire. There's the exodus again. You see that? Because I want to be, I, I, I can only be around you. That's why I, I've stayed here another day, because you're all beautiful people. And you, you make me happy, okay? Well, yes? Don't we, don't we have to convert these people? Absolutely. Yeah. Be with them. Treat them to dinner. Now and then. <laughs> Witness to them. Yes. But if they're going to drag your faith down, no. You know the limits. You are a wise person. You're a wise person, okay? Um, I, I, I will be with people, but if they're going to curse, I say, you can't do that in my presence. How many know they're not going to want to stay? Right? How many know I don't let anybody curse in my presence? And if they do, they start apologizing to me. I told you when I was working in ShopRite, everybody knew I wanted to be a priest. Did, I hope you appreciate what I had to do to be a priest. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm pushing carts and everything. And, and the back of the frame for Duke chickens are those little things that pop out. They were cursing. And they said, oh, Reverend, we're sorry, we're sorry. I just said, fall on your knees, fall on your knees. They would, I, I can't tolerate that. One man screamed at me once. My wife is going to Bible study. She shouldn't be there. She needs to be home watching boring television with me. <laughs> now tell her to stop. I said, no. And he started cursing. I said, good, sir. This phone will disconnect in 10 seconds. <laughs> because I, I can't hear those words. And if you're directing them at me, I guess I gotta forgive you. I forgive you. Goodbye. <laughs> so he had a little scroll open and said, What's the scroll? The scroll is the message. What's the scroll for us? Now, how many, ever, how many ever remember the word Pentateuch? Penta means what? Five. Oh, what does the two part of the penta mean? Scroll. Pentateuch means five scrolls. When you, when you travel with St. Paul, he, he carries scrolls around in the book of Timothy. He has little scrolls. What's Paul's favorite book? Isaiah and Deuteronomy. That, that's why, because he, in Genesis, he, he loved those three books. And so he has there, and, and he sets his right foot on the sea. Now, 
that we're going to have two locations here, the sea. So where, where is he? The sea. What do you think of the whole body of water? In, in the time of, of the Bible, the Mediterranean Sea wasn't called the Mediterranean Sea. It was called the Great Sea. Now, so where is John? He's on an island called what? Uh, Patmos. Patmos. So maybe he's looking out and he sees, uh, he sees the body of water, you know, with Greece and everything. He sees the body of water and he sees this big angel. He's, he's, uh, he's got fiery legs. He's, got, he's, in a, he's wrapped in a cloud of fiery legs. And so what is this angel saying? It's time for your deliverance. It's time for you to get delivered. And so, so what happens here then, um, the right foot, the, the right, right in the Bible is always the, the powerful one. What's the right foot mean? What's the sea represent? The Gentiles. Let me give you another Bible verse on that. In John chapter 21, what is Jesus uh, is talking to St. Peter, remember? In Topka. Jesus did the Sermon on the Mount in a place called Topka. Does everybody know that? Topka. At the bottom of Topka is where Jesus says to him, Peter, do you love me? If you go straight up the mountain, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus fed the four to five thousand in a place called Bethsaida. Bethsaida is, means in, in Hebrew, the house of mercy. Isn't that interesting? Jesus would feed them in the house of mercy. Very interesting, okay? So Jesus would feed them in Bethsaida, right, right next to another city you all heard of it many, many times, Capernaum. So here's Bethsaida, Capernaum, and Tapka. So what was happening here is there was the sea down there. What, what do you call the sea? The Sea of Galilee. Anybody ever hear the Sea of Galilee before? Now the word Galilee literally means surrounded by Gentiles. So the right foot is on the, the sea. Now let's find out where the left foot is. And on the land. So underline the word land there. Who's the land? It's Israel. Does Jesus love the Jews? Absolutely. Is Jesus getting them back? Absolutely. They're his people. According to Romans 11, 23 to 25, we're grafted on. The marvelous thing of that we're grafted on is this. As you and I are grafted on, guess what happens? We have the same beautiful blessing that the Jewish people have. And now our, 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 our goal is to get brothers and sisters back. And my rabbi says to me, he says, and I almost fell down under the chair. He says, you know what we believe? He says, my rabbi says, we are Jacob. What was Jacob's name changed to? Israel. Okay, we are, we, we are Jacob. What does Israel mean? To fight for God. And then he looks at us, and he, he, this rabbi believes, he doesn't believe in the Protestants. He says, you Catholics, you are. I said, yes, who are we? He said, we are Esau. And you know what he said? He said, in the Bible, they had a meeting and they reconciled. He said, we rabbis believe Esau is coming back to us. Isn't that funny? We're trying to get them back with us and they're trying to get us with them. <laughs> when I heard that one, whoa. Sounds like there's a bridge. All we have to do is get, meet them halfway, Father. Beautiful. Make sure we're on the same bridge. <laughs> so what is one of the signs before Jesus comes? The Jewish people are coming back. Aren't you excited? Romans 11, 23, 23, 24, 25. As, as soon as all of us hear about Jesus once, they're coming back. And, and, and right now, this, the, I think today they're, they're marching through Jerusalem. I'm, I'm glad I'm out of town, I guess. They're marching because they don't, the ultra-Orthodox do not want to go to military service. So they're, they're marching through the streets. Right now, right, right today. So Jacob, Jacob and Esau, so that's, that's in the Bible, and so that's what they believe. And so now we have the big angel. You see the Exodus theme? Where's foot number one? See. See. What does that represent? The Gentiles. Remember, remember how many fish are in the sea? Uh, Peter caught 153 fish. Does everybody know what that number means? 153 fish. It means back then, every known fish that was in the in the Sea of Galilee, there was only 153 species of fish in there. So, guess what that means? What that means is get the whole world. So one foot on the sea. One foot on the, on the land. God is getting his Jewish people back. 
God is getting this. And, and I told you, uh, and this is your homework, if you want to read a Jewish understanding of the end of time, prayerfully read Leviticus 26. And prayerfully focus in on verse 40. You know who told me this? My rabbi. Leviticus 26, prayerfully focus in on verse 40. And what, what is it when Jewish people will come back when they recognize the Messiah? Will they recognize the Messiah? Of course they will. We know his name. Jesus. Heaven. Did that rabbi who was very close with you read the New Testament? Yeah, hundreds of times. And he gave, uh, this rabbi gave me unbelievable insights into it. In fact, one day he took me on, uh, when we're getting it near our, our Holy Week, and I'll be sharing with you as I preach uh, this time, unbelievable insights. Remember, we're going to do the Seder on the first blood moon, the first day of Passover, we're going to do our Seder here, okay? You're all coming, aren't you? Okay, and I, I'm, I'm even going to feed you and burp you if I have to do that. Okay, so, uh, yes, uh, we read the New Testament, and I just, we need to help each other. <laughs> How, how do I say that in the best of love? Yes, Brother Marco. Um, which books do the Jewish, uh, what, what books form the canon of the Old Testament? What books form the, uh, um, it, it would be today the Protestant Bible, the Old Testament. The Jewish people do not accept um, Maccabees and Wisdom Ecclesiasticus Baruch um, and uh, Judith and Tobit. They don't accept them. Which Ecclesiastic? Not Ecclesiasticus or Sirach, it's called. Okay, they don't accept that. And by the way, just, just as a, a trivia question quiz, what was the first catechism of the Catholic Church? What was the first catechism book of the Catholic Church? Sirach, very good. <laughs> I answer my own questions and we stay happy. The reason why the Jews don't have those books is because they were translated into Greek. And the Jewish people only want Hebrew words. And by the way, you know what's very interesting? We believe now more and more and more and more that the only... New Testament book that was written in Hebrew originally was Matthew. We're becoming more and more convinced that Matthew was originally written in Hebrew, then translated into Greek, and then a gazillion years later into the English. With, 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 with Jerome, we, and I was, I was just in Jerome's study. I went downstairs, Jerome, where are you? You know, by the way, if Jerome made it to heaven, there's hope for everybody here. He was an arrogant son of a gun. I mean, if, if uh, St. Arrogance can get in, there's hope for all of us, so keep going, okay. So, uh, next, and he called out with a loud voice, verse 3. When, when, you, when you call out with a loud voice, remember when, when God comes, after, the first time was, uh, as First Kings 19 says with Elijah, remember, it was a, it was a soft voice, remember? Yeah. Mm. And Psalm 46, verse 10 says, be still and know that I am God. God. But when God comes in the great second coming, how many are you all going to hear it? And you know what you'll say? I can hear him now. You won't need your, you won't need your, uh, your ear megabyres there, right? And like a lion roaring, when he called out, the seven thunders sounded. So the seven thunders means the complete voice. Verse 4. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard from heaven saying, now this is the only time in, in, in Revelation God says don't do it. And we're going, to be, we're going to start now to be introduced for the first time the unholy trinity. Everybody know there's an unholy trinity. <coughs> what, what you deal with, I could take you on, if you want, if you're really interested, we could, I could take you on a lot of uh, journey, how do you deal with demonic spirits and everything else. When you, when you want to undo demonic spirits, <coughs> you've got to pray three times the trinity over people. Because Satan is locked. Don't, no, don't get nervous. That's as far as I'm going to tell you about that. But... The, the unholy trinity, we're going to be introduced now to the beast. We're going to be introduced to the dragon. And we're going to be introduced to the false prophet. This is the unholy trinity. The beast represents the father. The dragon represents the son. The false prophet represents what? The Holy Spirit. And so what, what does Satan do? He counters. Also, in this time period, when John's writing, John got exiled to Patmos. They couldn't kill him. They tried boiling him in oil. 
Weren't they nice back then? <laughs> Well, They're trying burn? to make mulligan stew out of them or something like that. He didn't burn? And no, he didn't burn. It just turned to a gel. <laughs> wow. So that's why they had an exile. If you read the, the, the Christians going to the Colosseum in the first century. Remember the Colosseum? Anybody in Rome? Yeah. <laughs> Christians died first in what is called the Colosseum. And now when I walk through there, I just hear all these cats meowing. Meow, 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 meow. My, 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 my guide said to me in Italy, <laughs> ask any question, Nino knows everything. I said, Nino. Oh, yes, Father. Nino, tell me how, what was the last day of the Colosseum? <laughs> Nino don't know, Father. <laughs> <What's the answer? laughs> gotcha. I love doing that. Uh, I, I need to repent of my sin. <laughs> but over on the other side of town in Rome was the Circus Maximus. That's where the majority of Christians got killed. But inside the Colosseum was, they tried killing us Christians. And you know what? They couldn't do it. They would say to us, fall down and worship Zeus. It's like, no, we're not doing that. It's only a statue. We're going to kill you. They, they tried to beat us. They, they, the whips turned to noodles. They threw us in with snakes and, and burlap bags. We came out and go, hello? And they got so fresh they couldn't kill us. And so John was part of that where they couldn't kill him. So they said, we've got to send this guy away. He's bugging us. So here in Patmos, he now is told about... So who would be, who would be, who's, who's also in the first century a picture of the beast? Nero. What's going on when John's going through um, the Christians are being persecuted by uh, the emperor called Domitian. Does everybody know in the first 300 years there was 10 persecution of believers? And some of the early great saints you hear about, like Saint Agathon and Agnes, remember all those saints? They lived there in the Diocletian time. We, went, we underwent 10 persecution. Why do we go 10 persecution? What, what's the number 10? The Ten Commandments. 10, Abraham was tested how many times? 10 times. How many Christians raised a sword in 300 years? Nobody. So what did we do to our detriment after that? We became too institutionalized and we took up swords. Jesus says to, in, in the movie that you'll see, Son of God, don't take up the sword. Those who live by the sword will what? Die by the sword. And so the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, they start making an appearance right now in this, in this chapter. So the unholy trinity comes because Satan has to copy. He's so stupid. Satan doesn't have anything original. And we're, we're stupider because he only used one trick on us all the time. Did God really say that? I was about to write, seal up where the seven thunders would have said, and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and the land lifted up his right hand. Now what's right hand mean? Truth and justice. It means swearing, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, you know, when I go to court, I, I told you how to get out of court. You know, jury duty. Yeah. Just say, Jesus forgives everybody and so do I, so goodbye. <laughs> It works for me. <laughs> I said, my job is not to sit in judgment on any person. Amen? Um, and I said, by the way, send your five bucks, too. Uh, you got me here, I want the five. I'll get a half a McDonald's cheeseburger later on, you know. Send the five bucks. So now notice here, verse number uh, five, and lifted up the hand, and verse six, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, the sea and what is in it, and there should be no more delay. This is it. God's really coming. This, this is the end. Now, after you go through all this book of Revelation, the end's going to surprise you. You know what God says in the end? He's very Italian. He says, basta, not pasta, basta, it's over. That's how God's going to end it. Because Jesus already, Jesus already did it on the cross, didn't he? By Jesus dying on the cross, he defeated your, your, he defeated all your sins. He defeated your death. He defeated all your sins. He defeated all your sickness. I, 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 like, I like this Sunday coming up because I always preach on the power of Satan, but you have the greater power. 
So get ready, we're going to stir up the juices this week. I can't wait to hear it myself. I'm excited. And now I swear by it. There's only one time in the Bible God swears. Everybody remember the only time God swears? Now if God doesn't keep his swearing, he ceases to be God. How many ever, how many hear the expression, I swear to God? Please don't say that. See, the Bible says in, in Matthew 5 and 2 Corinthians, say yes when you mean yes and no when you mean no. Nobody here has to ever say, I swear. That's unbecoming of you as a believer because you're always truthful. Aren't you always truthful? Say you were married. You tell your wife the truth all the time? All the time? Where were you last night? All the time? Okay. Very interesting. Very interesting. Don't you? So, yeah. So you tell the truth all the time, right? You don't lie, right? Very scary people here. So we don't lie. So he says here to us, John does, and swore by him, uh, the sea and what's in it, there should be no more delay. This is the time. This is going to happen. So, so this is the moment. And the only other time is in Genesis 22, 14, 15, and 16. What does God swear? God swears that he's going to, he's going to su supply the lamb. What's the lamb? Jesus Christ. Isn't that magnificent? The only time in the Bible God swears. Remember I told you about a million times. What's the word for Jerusalem in the Bible? Yerushalayim. Everybody like that name? Everybody say Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim. I like, I like saying in Hebrew better than English. Yerushalayim. Now what that means is this. If you want to get into the literal meaning of that, it's called the city of peace. That's a great title, but I, I like the, the original Hebrew, Hebrew, Hebrew. Yerush Shalai means God supply, God provides the peace, God provides it. So that's the birthing, in Genesis 22, <coughs> is the birthing of the word Jerusalem. Yerush Amen? So he goes on to say, but the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God. So the mystery is coming. Now, how do you say mystery in in Latin, everybody. Sacramentum. Have we heard that word before? The sacramentum. As he announced to his servants, the underline expression, the servants of prophets. When you have prophets, they're always called the servants. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus tells us, there's a group of servants that came. There's another group of servants that came. There's another group, finally the son. They're called the prophets. And are, are you all prophets? Everybody here baptized? You're all prophets, but guess what? The many times we don't use our gift of prophecy. What is the gift of prophecy? You stand up in, the, in your living room and say, Thus says the Lord. Do you do that every week? <laughs> <laughs> Here, here's what you do. I, I, here's your prophetic. And say, say you're the mother of the house. You say, Thus says the Lord. Clean your room right now. That's the prophecy I'm getting from God. Clean that room as a pig's die in the end's house. I just cleaned those dishes and the, the kitchen looks a wreck again. <laughs> what do you think this is? The new Mammoth Diner were open 24 hours? Or the, or the Red Bank Special now there? You're sinning. This is just a sin. Anybody, anybody speak prophecy? Hmm. And when you're married, how many know you speak a lot of prophecy over the person? A lot of prophecy over the person. <laughs> so underline the mysteries of God. And by the way, in Ephesians 5, what's the mystery of God? Marriage. How many, how many, are we married? You said, yes, marriage is a mystery. It still is a mystery. <laughs> mystery. And because I wake up every morning saying, what's it all about? Okay? So marriage is a mystery. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, down and following. And, and, and Colossians chapter 1, Paul says that when Jesus is revealed, it's a mystery hidden from our eyes, now revealed to us. So that's the mystery. And we heard it yesterday in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Everybody here who's a believer in Jesus, you are a dispenser of the mysteries. So that's why I love talking to people because I feel like, I feel like a, a Coke machine. You got to put your change in. Of course, dollar bills. Hi, my name is Father Bill. Ask me a question. I will give you the answer. I am a dispenser of the mysteries of God. What mystery do you want to hear right now? Do you want to hear what question on the Trinity? Do you want to hear question on the Bible? Do you want to hear question on my face? I am a dispenser of the mysteries of God. <coughs> I do that, you know. You didn't know that I was a, a, that I was a spiritual soda machine. So underline that there. So the servants, the abedim, the, the abed in Hebrew is the word for servants. These are the 
Okay, the Evel. EBD, Evel. Then the, the, the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again saying, go take the scroll. Ah, this is so exciting. Now, back in, uh, back in Hebrew school, you know what? You know, in Jesus' day, does everybody know only boys went to school? The girls, sorry, you didn't make it. You did not make school. And you know what they had to do? They had to learn their, their Hebrew. So what would they do a lot of times? They would make the letters out of candy. And so, how many know kids like candy? So, guess what happens? I want to learn my ala, bet, dale, gimo. So, <laughs> I mean, how many know a kid can down those candy things? And, you know, made their Hershey's and chocolate kisses and everything else. I mean, the kid's downing all this. And how many know? <laughs> at the end of the day, he's got the alphabet down, baby. And something else went down when he's doing all that. So, what happens when you receive God's word? How, does anybody here love receiving God's word? This is my passion in my life, to, to learn God's Word, to get it out. So, that's sweet. The Word of God is so good. I, you know, I study the Bible every day. I read the Bible every day for the Blessed Sacrament. I've got the Word of God in my lap. It's so good. So, let's see what happens here. Go take the scroll which is open in the hand of the angel who's standing on the sea and on the land. We told you he's standing what? On the sea. The sea. The what? The Gentiles. The land is what? Israel. So I went to the angel and told him, verse 9, to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take and eat. And you can tell God's Italian, manja, manja, manja. So what do you got to do with the Word of God? Eat the Word of God. So he said, eat the Word of God. Now what happens to, it's really, the Word of God is really good, isn't it? All right, now, we all love the Word of God on a good day, yes? But now we take it in, and today's, God, today's Word is love everybody. Forgive everybody. Bless those who persecute you. Non toccare. Don't touch. Do this. Do that. Forgive. Witness. I don't know if I like this word anymore. But God's word is so good. So what happens when you try to live it? Oh. oh. How many ever ate the wrong thing in your stomach and said you shouldn't have done that? Anybody ever have one of those moments in your life? When we've really taken the Word of God, it's like, oh, oh, oh. But now you know the Word of God, you're responsible for it, and you got to do it. So, take it, eat. it will be bitter to your stomach, but sweet as honey in your mouth. See the honey in your mouth? That's learning the, that's the Jewish kids learning the alphabet. It's really good, right? It's really, really great. But when you really want to, you want to hear the Word of God every Sunday, every day, you want to hear the Word of God, you hear it, but now you got to go live it. Right? I, I was teaching some of you last week, joy, joy, joy. Remember joy, joy, joy? And some of you tell me, I just went home, joy, joy, joy. Okay, and how many know you had joy, but you had to live it now? It's hard. It's hard. You know, when people are cursing at me on the parkway, I just got to go like this, you know, and just bless them. And One guy hit the back of my car, my car went up in the air, I went, right by St. Francis in Metuchen, I went, I was going to preach to them, you know, Tom Sarami and all those people over there and everything else. So I get out of the car, I'm like, my glasses went flying off. <laughs> <laughs> and the cops came right by and said, hey buddy, you alright? I said, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you need the hospital or anything? Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I'm alright. I got out, looked at my car. Oh. And the guy that did it to me was right there. Oh. I said, hello? I said, are you okay? He said, yes, I am. I'm okay. You're okay. Exchange the who. Have a great day. <laughs> And then I get, this, I get to the prayer meeting. And there's Tom Sarami and all those people over there. And they say, Should we take you to the hospital? You know, you're going to feel really bad in the morning. You're going to be like, you won't be able to get out of bed. You got a fever. I don't got a fever. You look peakish. I'm not peakish. I was fine the next day and my car was a little sick, but these things happen. Oh my. So how many know to live the gospel, it's hard. Good news. Because it'll liberate us. 
take it, uh, so underline so every time you think it's hard, you get that verse, verse 10. And I took a little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I'd eaten, my stomach was made bitter. That's living the words of God, it's bitter. How many of you have ever fought God said, I really don't want to forgive people. I'm not in a forgiving mood. I wish I were a bee. I'd sting a couple people right about now. <laughs> right? I'd kick some butt. How many ever felt like that? How many have ever kind of fought off that you, you just didn't wish evil on person, but it was welling up inside of you? What would happen to you is, as, as I met this man in beautiful Newark, New Jersey, you ever hear of the place? And a man shared his saliva with me. How many know that you just don't want to forgive a person at that minute? Thank you. It's cherry flavor. How many know it's really hard to live it? So that's the good news, and now it's like, lived. So what, what's the bitter in the stomach? It's, it's, the, it's the lived out word. You know, I wish I could just accept the word of God. Yes, I love it, and God take me so I don't have to live it right now. I believe it. This, let's go. Let's go. But, but now the rest of our lives is the living it out, and that's the bitter part of it. Right? Then he says there, verse 11, And I was told you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So this, uh, underline that. This is world evangelism. Everybody's got to know this message. Now we come to a, we come to a most phenomenal part of, of the scriptures. We're coming now to the very uh, top of the book of Revelation. We're climbing the mountain right now. I was, I, I was verse 1, I was measuring rod like a step, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God. Now, Remember the temple was destroyed what year? Do you remember the temple was destroyed? 70. 70. 70. Just give you a quick review. This is good stuff you're getting. When, when did Jesus die on the cross? April 5th? When's our Passover here? We're going to have Passover what, what day? April 15th. We're going to have Christian Passover here. Christian, uh, Christian Seder. Okay, now what happened is this. This is good, good stuff. Jesus died in the year 30. Okay. Well, not 330. There's a new movie coming up at 300 again. Now, what did Jesus do in Luke chapter 21? He said, he said in the year 30, he said, not one stone's going to be in that found another. And he says to the Jews that Jerusalem is going to be surrounded. During this generation, a generation is 40 years. In the year 70, there was the temple. You want to laugh and cry at the same time? It was completed. Remember, Herod was doing a massive job. The, te the, the temple began being done or started at 515 BC. You've heard of the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. About a month or so ago, I was in their grave. They literally were right below my feet. I said, Zechariah, if you're in there, knock three times. He didn't. If he did, I run out. So, <laughs> what happened in here is for 40 years, there, in Judaism, there was absolute chaos. The reason why the second temple falls is because brother was against brother. It was chaos. You were, they're buying off priesthood. Hey, we're not too far fetched today. A lot of uh, crazy things are going on in the world in the church. What happened in the year 66 AD? They completed the temple. Isn't that amazing? The, the whole temple was completed in 66 AD. As soon as it was completed, who marched in? The Romans marched in. They circled the city for three and a half years. Three and a half years. How long is Jesus' ministry? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. I always had the half on. Jesus started, he was baptized in the year 27, uh, uh, 26 AD, 27-ish, uh, and he was in October. How many know Jesus was baptized in October? So he come, he come, he, three and a half years, and the temple surrounded by the Romans. During this time, there were 1.1 million crucifixions. During this time, there was utter starvation. They even ate babies. There was no food. The Romans, when you went to Jerusalem, on the hills of Jerusalem, all the forests were stripped because of all the crucifixions. It was a terrible sight. During this time, unbelievable chaos. 
There was a man that walked inside the city. You know what his name was, of all things? Jesus. <laughs> and you know what he says? The destruction is coming. The ancient Jewish book called the Talmud. Anybody, anybody Jewish you know the Talmud? The Talmud in the sky appeared a gigantic sword. And then it was known that the, the gigantic Jerusalem gate was opening by itself. Now that's not easy to open because it's tonnage of a door. You know, it's, that's not the little door that you left your house in. It's a ton door. So all of a sudden they saw this door opening. And many have believed that was the power of the Spirit leaving because of what was coming. Three and a half years, they were destroyed. Now, the first temple was destroyed in 586 BC. The second temple is destroyed in 70 AD. And guess what we just found out? They both were destroyed on the same identical Jewish day, the ninth of Av. The same identical day. What happened is, Jesus' death on the cross is sufficient. That's why, when he dies on the cross, and if you've seen the Son of God, they did a good job on that, the movie Son of God. Jesus looked diagonally, and he saw right into the Holy of Holies, and the curtain ripped. That curtain, you know, they, they really should ask me to help them. <coughs> I, I, I just saw the movie, I mean, the curtain was blue. It wasn't blue. <coughs> and it was all decorated with, what was it? I didn't say real quick, I was falling asleep because it was midnight. It wasn't blue. It was red. There was a 45-foot high scarlet. But it was inaccurate, too, that movie. It, it was inaccurate. They didn't hire me to, to you know, point That's to what it. was. It was very inaccurate. It, 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 was, it was not. It, well, it, 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 we got the message. Yeah, we know so, that. So here, what happens is the same day. Now, look at verse 11. Chapter 1, I'm saying. <clears throat> Chapter 11. Measure the temple. Hello. You get what time period we are? When does John live? John is preaching what? Around the 90s. 90, 95 AD. When John is saying this, does there exist a temple? No. 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 There's no temple. And by the way, how many know there was a prophecy in Rome in 1976? Anybody alive in 1976? Mm -hmm. There was a prophecy, I'll give you the prophecy real quick. Not one stone is going to be left upon another stone. What if, what if there's no... Rome. What is there's no church at Rome? Does the church still go on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not one stone upon another stone. Because we 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 in the we in the Gentile church have become very corrupt. We have become sinful and Sodom and Gomorrah like like it, it, it's anybody's business. So what happens here is measure the temple. Well, wait a minute, John. What are you saying here? I have given a measuring staff, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar. What's the altar? The sacrifice. The sacrifice. And those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside. Now, in Judaism, the temple was here. What, what's it called? The temple was called the Holy of Holies, inside. Then they had another, uh, they had another place here called the Holy Place. And out here was the court. What's, what's the court called? The court of the Gentiles. This is where Jesus turned the tables over. Because if you would come here, and, and the film, the film, the, the, the film that's out depicts that very well. Mm -hmm. When you when you come out, you look at the whole place, and it's filled, filled, like a flea market outside. Have you ever seen those flea markets outside? And Jesus starts turning it over right out here. This is called the court of the Gentiles. And Jesus is upset because these are the people that are supposed to come in here, but, but they're blocking them from coming by, by having flea markets. I believe when we go to church that there should be clear passage into the sanctuary of God. That's why I get nervous when, hi, ladies and gentlemen, there's a brand new car outside. Give me $25. And you might be able to. You should not be distracted. You should go into the holy place of God. Amen? Amen. You should go right into the holy place of God. Not distraction. Because that, that's where your heart should be. And so what happens here, but do not measure the court outside. Here's the court outside, the court of the Gentiles. Okay, good stuff. And leave that out for it. Is written, oh, it is given over to the nations. All right, see it? Court of the Gentiles, the nations. Okay, <clears throat> now what's going to happen to the nations before the Jews come back? Romans 11, 23, 24, 25. What's going to happen? 
Every nation has to hear the gospel how many times? Once. How many times have you heard it? Daily. You can hear it any moment at any time in this country still, yet, so far. But that, that, is, that is starting to decrease. How many know that in, uh, in a, lot of, a lot of markets right now in the U.S., Christian music and, uh, and preaching is going off the air? Does everybody know that? Sure. The lights are starting to be turned off. I don't know if you're aware of that. They're, they're taking away Christian programming left and right around the country. So lights are going. So enjoy your Christian programming now. There might be a coming time very soon, even this year, you're not going to hear it anymore. So that's why you make sure you get here every Monday. Oh, this is going on until they shut us out here. <laughs> okay. And then leave that out for it is given to the nations and they will trample over the city 42 months. What's 42 months, everybody? Three and a half years. What's 42 months? This goes back to the book of Daniel. How many years of tribulation are there? Seven. seven. Daniel 7. Seven years of tribulation. What's going to be the worst time ever? The worst time ever in the seven-year tribulation is midway point. Now, I'm going to give you all the views of the end of time. I'll give you the Catholic view, I'll give you the evangelical view, I'll give you all the views of what's going to be happening. I'll show you where we all agree and what's going to be happening. I'll give you all the five things that got to happen and are happening right in front of our eyes. So, what happened is, this is, what happened to the Jewish people, they're in the middle of the three and a half. Now, an interesting thing happened. If you look at your maps of, of first century Palestine, the Christians understood Matthew 24, and they listened to Jesus' words, and you know what they did? They went to a town called Pella. Now, one Christian believer died. The Romans came in, and on, they were on the verge of, of wiping out Judaism, completely, completely destroying Judaism. But, but, Deuteronomy 32, Moses said Judaism will make it to the end of time. Deuteronomy 32. So, the Jews will be here because God's getting them back. Amen? I'm excited about that. He's getting them back. And I, I, I'm prophesying over you very soon, I think you're going to see more Jewish people coming into the church. So, if someone's sitting next to you, say, well, shalom. Don't say shalom yourself. Who are you? <laughs> Give them a hug and say shalom and welcome home, brother. Welcome home. Welcome home. Because the Mass is Jewish. This, you're going you're to be, in our time, you're going to be seeing this. The older you get, you're going to be seeing, you're going to be, you're going to be sitting in awe of what God is going to be doing if, if, you, if you're in tune with the Holy Spirit in your life. You're going to be seeing, I'm seeing this already. I'm getting excited. When I was in Israel, I, my Jewish guide said to me, Father Bill, I like your group. I said, good, I like you. And he says, you don't push Jesus on me. I said, look, he said, the evangelicals always push Jesus on me. I said, Adrian, you know about Jesus. You know the truth. For two weeks you've been telling me about him. You're doing a good job. Eh, for the most part. No, I didn't say that. I said, you're doing a good job. And I said, when you meet him, hopefully you will know him. Wow. Yes? Why, like from a political point of view, why did the Romans destroy the temple? Can you just do something different in prison then? Like, well, was it was a symbolic type of gesture? Uh, there, was a, there, was, uh, there was a change of, of leadership, Vespian. And uh, he, he wanted to get everything under his control. And by completing the temple, he, they, uh, there was very, they were becoming very powerful. Now, during, during this 40-year stint, the, the Jewish people, there was utter chaos. They were buying priesthood. But now he wanted to come and take over <coughs> full, full control and says, we'll do that. Now sadly, at this time, after 70, they took over, they, they wanted to exterminate Judaism, but it didn't happen. Right now, today, there's a very interesting fact. There is no such thing as a biblical Jew, because they can't kill animals. But guess what? The ultra-Orthodox Jews who are marching right now, this day, in Jerusalem, they want the animal sacrifices to come back, to be restored into the book of Leviticus and everything else, so they can restore it. That's why they have no central authority. When you talk to a Jew, they, they say, the rabbis say, the fathers say, they don't have one voice that says it. In the world, did you do, do you know there's only one church that has one voice? No other church has, a, has one voice. There's only one church in the world that has one voice. Amazing, isn't it? Do you see what Jesus was doing? 
Interesting, huh? And so right now, they're trying to, the Jews are trying to get back to biblical Judaism. And so the, their temple was destroyed. Measure it, it's gone. But the court, the court over here, who's the court? Here's the court, you're looking at the court right here. And what, what, what have we done? We have received the word of God. Sweet, when we try to live it, oh. Because now we've got to preach it, share with others that they too can be saved and come to a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you getting this? Do you see, do you see how crucial everybody's role here is in Christ? Because John sees this, and then this, this is the surrounding in verse number, uh, verse number three. And I will grant my two witnesses. Now, there's two witnesses coming. Two verify a what? <coughs> a fact. Now, who are these two witnesses? He yeah. says they're power to prophesy for 1,260 days. How, how many is 1,260 days? 42 months. 42 months, three and a half years, the same thing. Why do you think John's saying months and days? Because he wants to say the importance of each day. So now notice now two witnesses are going to rise up. Okay, this is, this is on the verge of happening. My rabbi said something to me that was so unbelievable. He, he, he prophesied this chapter. And I don't know if he knew he said that. He says, I've got to tell you something. I'm like, listen, yeah. He said, we rabbis in Jerusalem. Yeah, and I said, okay. What are you talking about over there? He says, we believe there's coming an unbelievable earthquake. Where it's on the exact timeline. It will come. And it's due any moment to my. When it comes, and I'm saying, he's saying about John 11. Now, what's going to happen is this. There's two witnesses coming back. Who are the two most powerful men in Judaism that ever lived? Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah. And by the way, this will be next week's uh, word. Not this week, next week. Moses, the law. How many laws are there? 613 laws. Elijah, the greatest prophet that ever lived. Now, Moses was buried on Mount Nebo, Deuteronomy 34. Nobody really exactly knows this grave. There's an apocryphal book you can get online if you want. It's called The Assumption of Moses. It's not in the Bible. There's no such tale of The Assumption of Moses. But if you want to go online, there's extra, extra what's called extra Jewish, Jewish reading that they believe Moses was somehow assumed into heaven. You got that? Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you want to read Isaiah's being chopped up, you can read about his being chopped up in uh, uh, Isaiah uh, in, in Hebrews 11. So an interesting that Moses comes now and we, there's, nobody knows exactly where he is in. Deuteronomy 34, it says he was on Mount Nebo, and then God, God takes him. Whether he, uh, he was buried, and God takes him, okay? We don't know where he's, there are alleged spots. If you go to Mount Nebo today, you can go there in Jordan um, and see, <coughs> see a, a, a supposed spot. Pope Benedict XVI was taken to that spot when he was the Pope. And so the second one would be Elijah, because Elijah never what? Died. So if he <coughs> died and was assumed, and he was assumed, how, how many know there's, there's the assumption right there? Mm -hmm. Now, an interesting thing on my particular journey in life, I went to La Salette, France. I had a wild nun drive me up there. But she is a speed demon. I saw a, tr a truck this close <coughs> in front of my eyes. I said, Sister, and I, I got to get translated from the French. I said, Sister, you do well in New York City. <laughs> she laughed when she got the translation. You got to wait for the translation. Sister, you do well in, uh, in New York City. Bonjour tout le New York City. Because the truck was like this. She took me up to La Salette. And that's, that's an apparition where Mary is weeping. Go online, if you haven't done so already, go online and get the message of Our Lady of La Salette. I went online and finally looked at it. She, Mary floored me. These are little kids. They could not have picked up what she said. They were uneducated, as Papa would say. They didn't give up apocalypse. You know what Mary said there? I was floored. And when, when I go around the country and mention Our Lady of La Salette, they said, no other priest has ever really, you, you, you went to La Salette, why? Here's what Mary said, back in the 1800s. She said, the two witnesses are coming back. And went, Mary was speaking about Revelation 11. You know what she said? She said, it's not Moses. 
She says, Enoch, Genesis 5.24. When you go online, go online and get it. Um, uh, so if you want to be part of Bill's interpretation or the Blessed Mother's interpretation, go ahead, let's vote. Who's the interpretation you want to go with tonight? So, uh, Our Lady Vasilet says, it's Enoch. Now, what I did... Enoch and Elijah? Or just Enoch and Elijah. Who is Enoch and Elijah? Elijah. 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 Elijah is the understudy. So I, I did... I did and why it really, uh, I was like, listen to Mary's interpretation of it. It's a blessed apparition by the church, so I'm really mystified right now. My head was spinning. I remember going into Minnesota, preaching up there, and I was reading all this. I, I can get your book if you want to read it, what the early church fathers thought about at the end of time. And you know what they said? They are debating who is, everybody is clear, it's Elijah. Who is the other witness? Is it Moses or is it Enoch? And they were going back and forth. And uh, Mary says Enoch. I think she's a better Bible interpreter than I am. But I have a question for Blessed Mother. I'm, I'm, you know, just a, teach me. When you look at when you look at what's going to be said here, it, it bears out Moses and Elijah. But these are the two people that never what die. Guess what? They will. They have to come back and die. Mm. Mm. They'll be persecuted here. Everybody has to die. Even though right now there are, these are the assumptions. Two assumptions in the Bible, or three. Um, uh, Catholic understanding, what are the assumptions? Enoch didn't die. Genesis 5.24. Who didn't die in the Bible? Elijah, 2 Kings chapter 1 and 2. You getting this? Two people never die. Now, but Moses, Moses did die, was buried, but we don't know where it is. So, so there is an extra biblical, outside of the Bible, that says he was assumed in heaven. Go online, put the assumption of Moses, you can read all about it. Okay. Is that the Bible? No, it's not the Bible. You just want to say, it's, it's allegedly thought. So that's all the background. Now notice that they come in verse number three. Is this good stuff? Father Bill? Yes. Why did, uh, why did Moses and Elijah show themselves with Jesus during the transfiguration? Then? Because that's a good question. These, these are the two most powerful figures. Moses is the one that holds the whole Judaism in his hand. What's Judaism in the hand? The Word of God. What's that? They had 613 laws. From Genesis to um, Deuteronomy, it's called the Torah. You've heard that, right? And also within Judaism, Torah does include, in a second level, it includes all the way to the prophet uh, Zechariah. That's the second level of the meaning of Torah. Torah means instruction. It's what they live, eat, breathe. Torah, in their understanding, pre-existed. That's why when you read John chapter 1, Jesus is the Logos who pre-existed. Jesus, as God, never had a beginning, nor will he ever have an end. We believe that solely as believers in Jesus. So he is Judaism. He is the one that says, um, this, this is the law. And in fact, there's a wonderful verse in Deuteronomy 18.15. And the Jewish people, as well as Catholics, believe it's for the Messiah. If you read your Bible, it's Deuteronomy 18.15. The Jewish people believe with the heart of hearts. Moses says, somebody is coming after me, like me, that will do the powers and even more than I did. Deuteronomy 18.15. Jewish people absolutely 100% believe that claim. All the prophecies in the Old Testament about Messiah, do you know the Jewish people 100% believe they're, they're about the Messiah? But Catholics say, Jesus. Jewish people say, no. Catholics say, you'll see. You'll see. But there's no, there should be never any arrogance. The more we learn about God, it's never to say, I know more about God than you do. It's to say, can I share God more with you? Yes. I think when he went further, he said, he will be greater than me. Yes. Listen to him. Yes. Uh, hello, what does the Father say? Listen. This is my beloved son. Mm -hmm. Listen to him. Listen. Hello. What should be ringing in the Jewish ears? Jesus. Deuteronomy 18. Listen to him. But who says it now with a lot of gusto? The Father. Very good. You're getting an A. I'm writing home to your mother that you're getting an A. So Moses and Elijah. Are you getting this? Now, I'm wrestling with the early church fathers. I wrestle with the vision of La Soleil. Through my studies now that I share with you, go with me and you can see why I would lean more toward Moses than Enoch. 
Okay, nothing against Enoch, I love him too. I'm going to have a cup of cappuccino with him in heaven. Okay. Yeah. Look, at, look at verse 4. Is this good stuff? These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. Now, olive means what? Oil. And the two lampstands. How do you say lampstand in Hebrew, everybody? Menorah. Now, where in the Bible do you see a menorah? That's very big. You see the prophet Zechariah. Not by might, Zechariah 4, not by power, but by my spirit. Do you remember that verse? Zechariah 4, 6. Do you remember that? So where is, where is, the, where is the menorah that appears? It appears first in the temple. Is the temple around? No. Gone. So where, where, is, where is the oil flowing? How many of all of you have been oiled? Oh, it's in us. Yes. The Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So what they did is they had a gigantic menorah, Zechariah 4, and outside, outside was the, the menorah. You know the menorah, right? One, two, three, and I got this real quick here. Outside the menorah, they have on, on each of the branches, they have what is called a lip, L-I-P. And on the lip, with the oil would be flowing in to keep it perpetually burning. Hello? Is that familiar? Something that's perpetually burning? Hello? Something perpetually burning? Upstairs. Do you see how we follow Judaism? The sanctuary lamp. It's got to be, how do you say menorah? What's the word inside menorah? Or light. The light, the or. The or is in there, the light. You are the light of the world, Jesus says, John 8, 12. I am the light, you are the light, Matthew 5, 16. So we can see now that these two men are coming back. So what are they going to do? They're producing what? The, the oil of God is being produced through them. They're seen in Zechariah 4 as the men under the what? Spirit. Now, through my studies, the most exciting thing I've ever studied is going to come. I don't know when Jesus is coming. Tomorrow, a thousand years from now, ten thousand years from now, I don't know. But one thing that I've understood very clearly, maybe to get you excited, what I believe has got to happen to the church is we have to have men and women like John the Baptist. What does that mean? That means the Holy Spirit is going to so take over your life. You got it? That you will have to have the oil of God really flowing through you. There'll be a new boldness in you like you've never had before. All the fears in your life will be gone to announce who Jesus Christ is. How many would like to see a church like that again? Mm -hmm. How many know we're under Wimpy? Remember Wimpy? And I'll gladly pay you back on Tuesday and uh, the cheeseburgers are raising too. We have Wimpy Church. But I want a church where there's mighty men and mighty women. For that to happen, there has to be, Luke chapter 1, there has to be an outflowing of the spirit and the power of Elisha again. And that is coming, if I understand correctly, on, the, on every believer in the time before Jesus comes. And I believe you're, you're the chosen race to get this full powering of it. So who, who's going to come? Moses and Elijah, Elijah, Enoch and Elijah? Let's find out who they are, okay? Right now, I'm still leaning toward Moses and Elijah, okay? Well, and you can tell why. Look at verse number, and uh, we've got about an, another minute or so. Is this good stuff? And uh, verse 5, if anyone could, would harm them, fire pours out of their mouth. What, what do we see fire before? This is Elijah. Because in 1 Kings 18, he was facing the prophets of Baal. They set up a sacrifice. Whose God is God? He prayed in chapter 18, verse 20, a 20 second prayer. And boom, what came out of the sky was fire to take up the sacrifice. So fire came out of his mouth. Yes. Also in the desert, when the fire, when they each held the fire as they're running through, as they're coming out of the tent, they're running through, they're going to destroy the people who were disobeying. Remember in the uh, desert? The fire's coming out through the, uh, what they're holding this, what are they holding? The candles, as they're coming through out of the tent. Remember the tent? Oh, Gideon. No, 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 no. In the desert, Father, uh, with Moses, when they sinned, who was the one? Achan. He was Achan. Right. That's Remember Joshua. the ones that were sinning? It was Achan, the, the, the 
land broke open and oh, swallowed that's, them up. Oh, that's number 16. Right. Remember when yes, the, number 16, uh, yes. The uh, ground opened up and swallowed them Right, but remember when uh, God was in the tent. Dave, you think of is that one picket? Yes. Uh, is that the fire? They came with Joshua. Before? You know, the ground opened and took him for a ride. How I many of our grounds are opening up today? How many of one lady went out to her car and it was, she was in it and the car went into the ground? <coughs> yes. Kentucky, Kentucky. Okay. And ne next, uh, next day, it pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. That's, if you're writing there, 1 Kings 18. If anyone would harm them, thus he would be doomed to be killed. Then they have power to shut the sky. That's who? 1 Kings 17. That's Elijah. Next, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. Who's that? Elijah. He spoke a word. How many would like to have the power of eternity? Whatever, whatever you say happens. I wish I had that power. You know how many people I'd shut up? Oh, man, I'd go... So he had that power, uh, power there, and he says there, then they're prophesying, and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood. That's why I believe it's Moses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I want Mary to appear to me tonight, and uh, and we can talk about Enoch there in La Salette. Yes. It's like the, uh, the transfiguration, the apostles knew that it was Moses and Elijah. But Peter, right. the, the, likewise, the Jewish people they did. should know who they P Peter, James, and John knew that it was. That's a very good point. Moses and Elijah. Why Elijah? Because Elijah was the greatest prophet of all. So in order, and what were they both doing on the top of the mountain? They're saying, Jesus is the one. Jesus is it. That's what they're both doing. The greatest man in the, in the Bible says, he's the one. So the Jewish people should recognize the witnesses. Yes, they, they, will. they will. They will. They will. It's already starting right now in Israel. They are saying, uh, they are, they're starting to say, something's missing. Hello? Yes, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then we can see their power over the waters to turn them into blood, right in there, right in there, the first plague of Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. And to smite the earth with every plague. Hello, it sounds like Moses. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, Mary says, uh, I, I have to talk to her about it, okay? Uh, so, mm -hmm. blessed mother, let's talk, okay? Uh, uh, show me so I can understand. As often as they desire, verse 7, and when they have finished their testimony, the beast, are now underline that's the first time in the Bible we have the word beast. The first time in the Bible we have the word beast. Was the unholy trinity? The beast, the dragon, and the false one. That's the first mention ever of the beast. Everybody see that right there? Now, going back to historical time, going back to 70, who would be the beast around the temple time? It would be Nero. If you want to do all the different levels, you would, you would, uh, you'd go to a lot of Bible studies like this, and they would only give you the first century perspective. I don't like that perspective. I like the whole, the bigger picture. That's what I'm doing for you today, the bigger picture. So underline that there the first time. And um, that ascends from the bottomless pit. We'll make war upon them. And how many know, that's Daniel 7, that, how many know right now we're at war? And, and how many know that the, the Lord, uh, the, the war is starting to claim some of your kids? Your kids are wounded right now in the battle, and they don't know it, do they? I don't believe in God. I don't need God. I don't, I, me and God have this, he's my bud, we have this thing together. But you have a drink called a bud, too. And they come from the bottomless pit and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street and have the great city. This is Jerusalem. So what are we going to do to these two men? Kill them. What's the name of, if you underline there, what's the name of Jerusalem at this time? Sodom and Egypt. What has become of the temple? What happened in these 40 years of chaos? It's now like Sodom and Gomorrah. What does our church look like in many places? Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what? I've been ordained 31, 32 years now. What I've seen behind the scenes. Whoa. You know what I said? Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. I have enough dirt to write a book to destroy the, to try to destroy the church. I'm never giving out the information. I love the church. I love Jesus too much. But what I've seen, I could cry. 
I could cry one of these. I love our church. I believe in Jesus and our church. And I'm with it all the way. But what I've seen, Sodom, Genesis chapter 19, Sodom and Gomorrah are, are, are two, two cities on the, on, the, on the Dead Sea. It's where, where we get the expression in Genesis 19, fire and brimstone. What happened to, what happened to Jerusalem? It's Sodom and Gomorrah. Why did the Romans circle three and a half years? Jerusalem was Sodom and Gomorrah. Now what are these witnesses doing now? What are they going to say? Sodom and Gomorrah. Are we going to listen? No. We're not going to listen. Maybe a few here and there. Are we going to listen? He says to where their Lord was crucified. That's how we know it's Jerusalem, because the Lord was crucified there. But now, and we're done. Three and a half day, three and a half days. Does that sound familiar? Excuse me, Father. Um, there's a lot of crazy people walking around the road. Saying I know, they live where you Moses live. I'll tell you, they're, they're, they're down by that town. How are we going to know that, that it really is the true prophets? Really, I mean... How, how we're going to know because of what their message will be and the power that they'll be theirs. But will we believe it? No. Now there's notice, a lot of nuts walking around with Rome saying that... Uh, yeah. no, notice, and we're done. Uh, we'll continue. Good point. Good, good cliffhanger. Notice it's three and a half days. So what are these men going to do? This is a mini version of what just happened on a maximum scale. You and I are involved in many, many versions of telling people about God. And look, can I be honest with you? They don't want to hear it today. It's <clears> terrible. <throat> I've been blessed. I'm starting my sixth month here. And you've been nothing but a blessing for me. Thank you. But you know what? Some people just don't want to hear it. And I look at them and I'm like, if I told you who I'm arm wrestling with here, it would shock you. I won't tell you. That they can understand what they're saying. Don't get nervous. We've got great priests here. But brothers and sisters, they don't want it. So here now, the three and a half years is now three and a half days. What does three and a half mean? The tribulation. Stay tuned, dot, 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 dot. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued. Next week, we go into the woman clothed with the sun. Who is she? Very interesting. I can't wait to find out myself. Does everybody know Jesus your Lord and Savior? Yes. yes. Everybody commit your life to Him. Yes. Everybody got the dates down. We're going to be meeting an extra day, April 15th, the first day of Passover. We're going to have a Christian experience of Passover. Uh, we're going to take you outside, and I'll show you the red blood moon, uh, which will happen on day probably once in our life. Uh, it's going to happen four times this year, a year from April to April. And uh, I'll explain to you biblically what happened and to see. And you, you, you'll be delightfully amazed what happened. It'll go right into the Holy, uh, Holy Week message. And so I'm going to take you outside for 10 minutes. And hopefully it's not freezing like today. Um, uh, please pay your taxes by then. And, uh, and so April 15th, we're going to be meeting um, in the hall. We're going to have a Seder. Everything is to meet Jesus. You're going to see things like you never be, uh, never have before. It's going to be terribly exciting. And we're going to have dinner. So um, if you have 20 extra dollars, uh, it'll be a catered dinner. Uh, we'll, we'll start taking $20 from everybody so we can get the caterer and everything else. And there'll be, you know, chicken and pane vodka, whatever, all that stuff. Like and meatballs and breads and desserts and everything else and, and soft drinks and everything else. And there'll be the wine for the uh, Seder meal and everything else. So we'll be doing it and we'll be doing we'll be doing um, very close to what uh, our elder brothers and sisters in the Jewish faith are doing that very night. They're going to be doing it. We're going to be doing it here. We'll be talking about the Lord Jesus and show you the connection. So it's me. And we'll go out and look at the blood red moon. Hey, are you excited? Yeah. I'm excited. You don't look too excited. This is exciting stuff. Huh? All right. So that's <coughs> April 24th. Um, oh, there's a show in Lancaster again called Moses. It's a brand new, brand new, brand new, brand new show. The price tag is 112 American pesos. Includes your bus ride, your dinner, and the show.
April 24th. So if you're going to that, start getting that money in right away, okay? Okay, a lot of, and, and then Divine Mercy, we're going to have a full, we're having a full nine days, a full nine days here. Father Richard Holland is coming, um, June 7th will be in the Great Auditorium in Ocean Grove. So you've got a lot of activities going on. I'll be dead in your vacation after all of this. Sister? I don't know if they have TV coming up. That's what I do. tickets for that, the Great Auditorium? I, I, think, I think there is, uh, I think there is, there is going to be a little price there because I don't know how much they're charging us there. We've got to pay the rent on that. What is it called? What is it's, called? It's, it's, it's the Vigil of Pentecost, a Pentecost Vigil. rally. Pentecost rally. Okay, good stuff. Yes. So make sure you get that day off. Okay, good stuff. And uh, now, when do you want to do the Mass? Do you want to do it this week upstairs? Wait, should, I, should I check with uh, what's going on and give you a date next week? What should I do? Yeah, check. Okay. okay. If, if anybody wants the DVDs on the mass, they're upstairs. Can we get one? Yeah, you can get one. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Father, we just ask your blessing. We thank you for the word. We thank you for the uh, love of information tonight on who you are, what you've done. And, and Lord, may we witness our faith and may we not be afraid. And, and Jesus, may the power of your love help us to stand against the evil. For you, Lord, bless this people with goodness. Bless this people with salvation. Bless this people with the Lord Jesus Christ. In season and out of season. In Jesus. Amen. 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 Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Welcome back from Spain. You're falling asleep back there. Wake up.